Now, I've, I've never been with a woman, um, but from the research I've done, the three types I'm familiar with Wait, are... We're talking are, visual novel uh, research. Well, you got teen, you got MILF, yeah. and you got exotic. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG Podcast. I am Clayton. I'm Haley. KD. I'm Nina. Kyle Perkins. Uh, I'm Clara. And I'm Kata. And uh, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. We are on Facebook. We also have a Patreon at patreon.com slash alienfamiliarmedia. So if you enjoy our content and would like to help us out, any help would be greatly appreciated. This is the second half of our discussion on how to roleplay high and low stats. This episode focuses on how to RP the mental stats, and we pick up right where we left off in episode 64. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I found some rope. <laughs> I'm playing with it. Oh, so, I'm horrified. Uh, intelligence, wisdom. Uh, yeah, intelligence. <laughs> yes, yeah, so nobody in this group has. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> yeah, Pushing I, rope. I, I can go. <laughs> Very smart, actually. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're transitioning away from physical stats mm-hmm. to wizard stats. <laughs> so, yeah, if we're talking like traditional D&D characters, you're thinking wizards. So very high intelligence, where um, they're using that ability to augment their magic, do more damage, and blasto you with book words. They're like, I read these words and they hurt you. Huh. Uh, that's actually how Gygax wrote it in Intelligence. <laughs> but, um, hey. Glass houses, throw stones. If we're talking, <laughs> Mr. If pushing rope against my glass house, please. Um, but if we're talking about high end, usually again, going off like what when I first started three point five um, in fourth edition, like what I was explained in the very base term was you're thinking those um, not quite hoity toity, but definitely the characters who like went to a college, the mages' college. Usually, if we're talking like fantasy, and they usually think that they're better than you. It's because like, oh, this barbarian he can break this wall, but I can think around. The wall. My portals, or my, you know, a different thing, different spells I can conjure. It's like, you have one way of breaking these things, I have dozens, and my spell book will do that for me. So it's the idea that you can think on a, a higher plane, and um, these characters, you usually when a lot of people RP them as being as such, or then a scholarly figure who may be more, like, reclusive, like saying, oh, I'm just going to stick to my books, do my studies, you kids do your own thing. So that's, Kenny, like, the two I've seen. I want Kenny to make all of my characters free from now on. I mean, I can help you. <laughs> hey, I maybe we should, like, charge money for that. This is hey. not this is not the podcast <laughs> topic. No, I'm kidding. So with physical stats, we can all think of examples of what it what it is to have those stats and how we can play a character who has those stats. When it comes to these mental stats, we can think of examples of people who represent the high ends of these mental stats. Mm-hmm. But how does a person play a character who is more intelligent than themselves. You just don't. I think that does rely a lot on GM knowledge. Um, Like, it's like, okay, so roll to know about this specific academia focus, and you roll and it works. So you would know about that in character, Mm -hmm. but you might not have the words for it in real life. I think that is a lot to do with the world and not so much the player. But it also includes... Not only your ability to know things, but also your ability to work through things mentally. And that's the barrier that I can't work out. How do I play a character who has a higher intelligence than mine? How do I play a character who has a higher wisdom than mine? Well, right off the bat, you can have low or average intelligence, I guess. That sounds weird to say. Uh, and be very curious. And I was going to say, in a game, if you're playing a very intelligent character... You, the player, I think you need to be curious about everything. Mm -hmm. Ask about everything. Even if you don't know and can't figure out and won't be able to solve the puzzle as you, the player, by asking about all the parts and making the GM explain, okay, make me an int roll or an academics roll or or some kind of knowledge check. Uh, Okay, your character knows this and that. Your character recognizes this piece of this item or this puzzle. Um, and the more you ask, the more it will kind of give the party the knowledge, and maybe you can solve that puzzle together, and then technically you've, like, crowdsourced your character <laughs> well, right. thinking through the problem. See, I don't know, like, that's one of the reasons I never play <clears throat> high in characters or wisdom characters, because I don't see myself as someone who's very averagely smart, and I feel like 
that's not me playing a character, that's just me relaying information. That's why I have a lot of reverence for people who can play high intelligent characters, like our friend Nina, who is not here at the moment. Uh, she is one of the smartest people I know, and she's constantly playing like scientific characters or doctors or people who are just leagues and leagues smarter than me or my other or my characters and I have a lot of respect for that but I know that I can never do it because I always feel like my characters are smarter than I am well when I said at the beginning jokingly Clayton asked what do you do if the character you're playing maybe has like a disconnect with you in terms of intelligence and I was like don't it wasn't so much a don't as it was you can't like you have to rely on those roles to facilitate that or like Kyle was saying you have to ask a lot of questions like crowdsource stuff because like most recently i played a character who had a really high intelligence but i suck at puzzles like i am fucking awful mm-hmm. i didn't do enough as a kid it was a deficiency <laughs> uh that my parents always laugh about they're but like we never had to do puzzles and they're like you're, so you're bad at puzzles <laughs> yeah. now sorry son um <laughs> wait that, the, oh god we have to get into this later it's a very specific thing for your parents to make fun of i like, kind of love it yeah and so i'm really awful at like D puzzles and stuff but we, in this game, you know, I was the chess master. I was the fucking, like, smarty <laughs> The puzzle master, really. Um, and so every time there was a puzzle, though, I would always have to be like, somebody else do it. And it would be like, wouldn't your character, like, be super into this? And I would always be like, sure, he is, but I'm not. Like, at that point, you have to either, the GM has to be like, okay, like, Kyle, have your character make an intelligence check. You have a plus four to it. Like, maybe we can suss this out together. <clears throat> or you have to, like just assume in the universe of the game that your character helps everyone else figure things out. Um, Heck, I could even see a way around this being, like, your character thinks it's beneath them to solve the puzzles, and so they just go, I already have the answer, but I'll let you figure it out. I'll check yours. (laughs) Um, And then, in reality, you're just being like, guys, please do this puzzle. (laughs) If you have a player who super hates puzzles, I just thought you you could have, you know, the the DM could make the decision to be like, okay, um, Jonathan's character... Um, whose name is also Jonathan, because, man, this guy has no creativity. Um, he uh, would know how to solve this puzzle, but Jonathan's a dumbass, and, he, and Jonathan's like, yeah, sure I am. And so everyone's <laughs> cool with this. And he's just like, well, you are going to um, do an assist with everyone else, and so like you give everyone else advantage on a couple of rolls to solve this, mm-hmm. or you, you give them a, a single-time bonus on something, and that reflects them helping, even though Jonathan's just there like, Puzzles. I hate them. Puzzles. <laughs> you could even be See, like, Jonathan, because he's so smart, gives you like one free Google. Because if it's a puzzle like <laughs> reality, like That's grounded in reality, yeah. you know, and you obviously don't want someone to cheat, you could just be like, y'all get one free Google because Jonathan's real smart. That's I just yeah. wasted it on tits. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, damn. <laughs> Does this count? Um, but no, I, I was going to say, it's interesting you guys bring that up because I do this in 3.5 and especially in my new game, my Star Wars one. Um, one of my friends, he's the, the Force user of the game, so would know more about the Force, but the player... So, um, he doesn't know much about it because he's like, I'm a Star Wars fan. I just don't know much about the EU. So the way I extrapolate that, because his character would know. Star Wars is, fan um, doesn't know much about the EU. I was being nice to let him in the Extremely game. possible. I like, <laughs> um, but no, um, I, I would have a rule, and judging how high he rolled, I would give him like three, like almost like hit tips or hints. Like yeah. saying like, these are things that you remember from your studies. And then he'd relay mm-hmm. that or translate it to what his character would say. It. But that's how it puzzles. Like people would say, my character would know this. I would do, yeah, give them hints. And, um, that's the way you get around if the character doesn't know, but there's on the flip side, like, and I've seen this for, like, more veteran players, this is more of a unique case, but um, the way people play intelligence in 3.5 that I've seen if they played for years, like one of my friends uh, who'd played almost as long as I had in my last game, um, he was a warlock intelligent character, and um, he just based off his own knowledge of D&D, and his character would know that too, so he's like, oh yeah, I know it rattled things off, because that's how he played, because he literally knew it. So after you play the game long enough, you can literally be that intelligent character, but that relies on the fact of you playing for a long time. And that's a way I've seen people do it. That's a difficult thing too, is if you, the player, know a lot about the Forgotten Realms And again, that's meta-knowledge, that's universe, you have to make right. sure you keep it in check. But, so. but like, the DM is literally just like, you know, sorry, like, Norgon would not know yeah. that. Like, and that's why early really? on you have to set those parameters. Jonathan and Norgon, they're buddies. I, I find that so much easier, playing a character that knows less than me. Playing a dumbass character is so much fun and like so much easier than playing a high, high, high yeah, it's character. It's difficult. Because even, even if I know way more than my character, I can still play that character very, very well as yeah. a dumbass. 
Because you're right, like, that's my friend that we had to set very strict parameters, like, you would not know anything outside of this, even though you clearly do, and if it's meta knowledge, we just say, I'm sorry, you don't know that. So it's still a, a very fine line you have to tread, so it's never easy to play a high intelligence character like that. Kind of going back to the joke I made earlier about, like, low intelligence and high intelligence, one way you could portray a character who is higher intelligence than you, but, like, as long as everybody else at the table is aware that this is what you're doing, try to use those bigger more erudite words that are a part of your vocabulary that you don't always get to bring out, and that can be a way that you can show off that uh, your character is more intelligent, possibly, than what you are. <laughs> Those five dollar words, man. Bring love, them out. <laughs> I love this thing we have of, like, smart people are arrogant. <laughs> That's one way people do if you don't, like, have... Like, you're right. Like, if you can't, like, back up with a lot of, like, I don't know about the game, yeah, you just act like, I'm better than you. I, I don't need to solve this. I went to Academy. Like, I went to that mean? I'm literally, like, I'm playing a wizard right now that has a plus five modifier to intelligence. Oh, my gosh. And um, he's literally always just like, I went to school! Like... <laughs> I don't, like, he's like Has in hell and the devils out? are just like, what the fuck's wrong with you? And he's like, I'm just here to write, like, my my second book. Like, I need to get tenure. Fuck you guys. Like, this is awful. But does anybody ask, like, where's your degree? Come on, you said that a lot. Show it to I me. I have my degree. Oh, so you'll pull it out pretty <laughs> oh, frequently and be like, this is the, I, I went to school. So you're This is my doctor. This is me as soon as I graduate. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, amazing. So, like, I think that could be fun because, like, it's kind of tongue in cheek in that, like, everyone kind of knows that, like, you're being a piece of shit. Um, versus, like, an intelligence character that's literally all the time just being, like, you know, to maybe someone that isn't in on the joke, just, like, cutting them down and, like, being super shitty. I feel like that's a little worse than, like, educated, like, full-of-themselves fucking wizard or something, yeah. you know? But someone that's, like, cutting someone else down repeatedly, like, as <laughs> we'll put more words in Jordan's mouth, I guess that's what? the barbarian punches the wizard. I don't know. I think that's, you know, because well, yeah. does a high, because to turn it to low intelligence, then. Does a high intelligence character constantly shit on a low intelligence character, or does that depend on other factors? They don't factors? have to. That, that's a character that's just a goal. thing. Yeah, that's I, just the goal. Is that's that what a bully. No, <laughs> that's, just a bully. <laughs> that's just the goal of the game. <laughs> I thought you were just like <laughs> that's, that's how I win. Because <laughs> that, that's me. Um, but it's interesting too because you could think, and this is more of a different case. But there's another way you could play a high end character where um, I've kind of done this, where they're not necessarily an intelligent person, because if you're talking about 3.5, that just means you're really good at magic. So you can say you are adept at magic, and that just shows you the stat to prove it, but you're just like still like, yeah, I don't know much more than you guys, I just know how to use magic, and that's how I extrapolate my intelligence. Like, I'm just really good at casting spells, and that takes a lot of mental focus. So you're just good at doing that. So you don't have to play that hoity-toity, like, wizard. You, you look like the dude right now. <laughs> By the same token, a low-intelligence character... Um, doesn't need to be a fucking dumbass. No. Like, you know, imagine a, like, um, uh, a witch who lives in a hut in the woods. You can all picture that archetype. Yes. They probably don't know uh, anything about uh, the current si system of government that's set up. Uh, they wouldn't know uh, a rich history of the entire continent upon which the game takes place. And they might not be able to uh, do any magic, we'll say. Like, they're they're more of like a... Like potion a, a potion, a potion master, but but they've got like high wisdom and high survival skills, and they're able to forage for you know they they know what plants uh, through experience maybe you know, not necessarily yeah. through like intensive academic study. They know what plants can do what, and they can grind you up that just the dopest potion. <laughs> you need a potion, you know I got a potion of dopeness. <laughs> well, you're right. That's how a lot of people offset that low intelligence. Is wisdom is a very good score to do that because that shows that you have life experience that has you just as well off, if not better, than somebody who's high intelligence. Because they're usually seen as more naive in many cases, where they're like, "I went to university, but whoa, buying like how do I how do I mortgage a house?" And the wise person is like, "Let me show you. Come with me. I've mortgaged so many houses, like you know." And that's just how you can that's how you can role play in different ways. Uh, I have a character who was raised as a noble, so he would have the education and the ability to be very smart in certain things. But like, I didn't have like it's a very low XP kind of game, so I don't have the uh, luxury to put my skills into certain things, because I am I'm also a knight to be. Um, so I have to focus on damage and strength and not dying. So I don't have the ability to put into these things. So I play that off like more, less about skills and more about role playing. Mm -hmm. So he is actually very smart and knows things that I as myself don't know about like the world or the government or the religions of the place. But I I I know that he is smart. But his stats don't reflect that. So he would be considered a low-int character because he has a D6, I think, in intelligence. It's in a vaguely savagey world system. Um, based on my other skills that are D12s and, like, D8s and D10s. 
So he is a little bit dumb based on stats alone, but he knows so much about very specific noble things, but less about, like, magic and other books and sciences and medicine. I don't know. It's, it's hard to play him certain times when it comes to, like, academia because he knows very specific smart things, but my skills just do not reflect that at all. I, I'm just reveling here. I love Lowen characters. <laughs> They're some of my favorite. Lowen, low wisdom, I'm into it. So, like, I know in older movies, um, like, Jerry Lewis's uh, The Nutty Professor. I um, can't remember, the, like, the Flubber movie. I don't remember. Not the Robin Williams one. The, like, old Disney. Oh, um, I'm going old school on this. All of those really smart people were always portrayed as kind of, like, absent-minded. Like, mm. the absent-minded professor. That's the name of it, because <laughs> absent-minded. Um, like, it's a cliche that these really intelligent people are also... These people who are high end are either low charisma or low wisdom. Nerds. There's some other, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you want to scream that a little bit more uh, angrily, like I uh, don't oh, know, I can't remember the name of the character from Alpha Beta and Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> Nerds, <laughs> nerd. It, it's only a movie that came out like uh, 35 years ago. Oh, so, so get with it. Me. All it's right, I'll, I'll get better. So those those types of characters in media are. Usually really high intelligence, but also low in other mental stats. It's like they you can't have a character who is high in every mental stat. There has to be some huge gaping deficiency. And I kind of want to transition into kind of talking about <clears throat> wisdom now. Like, that's kind of a way that, um, particularly with low wisdom, they're just not aware of how people act. They don't, they're not able to pick up on the nuances of the way that people act. Um, as much as I hate to bring up that god awful show, the boing bang boing. Oh, oh that's boing. thank you. Yeah. Uh, Bo Nipple. <laughs> uh, hey, what's that show actually called? Because now you've said four different uh, things that I can't remember. The Big Bang. The Big Bang. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> the wrong show. Because <laughs> that, that's something, all of those characters, they're all very, very high high intelligence, but they're always, they all lack one or the other mental attribute. I distinctly remember the first character I ever made for a D20 modern game. I think it's still called Wisdom, but the equivalent of the Wisdom stat, if it's not Wisdom. Regardless, the Wisdom stat, I struggled to grasp, and still kind of do. Like, Nina, Wisdom is my constitution. Oh, is it? Oh, very interesting. I have no explanation for wisdom for you like you did for me with Khan. I'm so sorry. I, I have it written down here for the D&D if uh, you want wisdom. Here, Gagax. Wisdom is the only one of these that does not with, uh, start with. All of them start with strength measures, dexterity measures, constitution measures, charisma measures, wisdom, reflex, Good no. how attuned you are to the world around you and represents per, uh, perceptiveness and intuition. And that's, like, the way that my friend's dad explained it again when he really brought me into 4th edition, which still little shout-out. your friend's dad? Yeah, he's one of oh, I didn't catch that before. Oh, sorry. So he's my first DM, because they love D&D. &D. My friend, they used to do a lot of family D&D. &D. So he's really, like, in my formative years of D&D, &D, he was kind of like a fatherly figure, helped teach me about a lot of, like, what D&D &D, Because a lot of it didn't make sense to me. And he was like, um, here's what how we talk about wisdom, like, to make it easier for new players. My heart grew um, three sizes hearing this. <laughs> can he was I, great. Uh, I loved him. Can I but, buy the book, Kenneth... The formative years? Yeah. It's just, it's, oh, no. The formative years, uh, high rolling. Still have a wow. d20 on the front. Um, but the way he described it, though, because um, I played a fighter who had high wisdom, because you need that for a fighter, and he was like, the way that we talk about it, especially in terms of your fighter, like, this is all the uh, collective intelligence of your, like, martial knowledge. He's like, this is how you know when to strike, how to do it, uh, tracking in the woods, again, that perception and intuition, like, knowing that moment when you can see, like, the subtle body movement someone's doing to be like, oh, they're about to punch me in the head, and they're having, a, like, a dagger in their hand. So it's almost about survival instinct alongside, like, streetwise. And that's why I said a lot of fighters and, like, martial people who aren't, like, I'd say, like, traditionally intelligent, like you were saying, like, those scholarly people. This is how you have your intelligence in one stat. Am I wrong to think that, like, a low wisdom character is, like, I refuse to think things through? Absolutely. I think that recklessness <laughs> is definitely a reflection of having very low 
Yeah, because that, that's that's the Nina Richner character yeah, go-to. You see like a skull at a door, and you're like, oh, it's probably just a bone library. And you walk in there, and then, like, you know, <laughs> daggers come out. Well, I just <laughs> remember specifically once I was playing a really low-wisdom character, and me, Nina Richner is a really low-wisdom character. <laughs> uh, we were playing this game, and we find this artifact. I think KP was the DM. And I'm like, oh, I pick it up. And everybody's just like... Do you, though? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I put both of my hands fully on this magical item. Where am I? I Tell me where I've gone. (laughs) So anyway, like, like that, that, that's, that's what I always saw wisdom as. That was, it was a one shot. And that's what I always see wisdom as is like, low wisdom is I refuse to think things through. And and then, then I go from there. It's almost imagine like the, um, if you're playing Fire Emblem or any of those games, the seasoned veterans, they're like, oh, kid, follow me, I'll take you under my wing. Like, their teachings are very wisdom based. Where they're like, oh, you know, always strike for the legs when you see a harpy, because that's cool. And they have reasons behind it why they do that. They got those little chicken legs. Yeah. So again, it's more like the, the, almost life lessons you learn. That's how I see wisdom. Do you think Harry Carey would be high in wisdom? Hey! (laughs) I think I got a lot of wisdom. So kind of like UKP, I, my characters oftentimes suffer from low wisdom, but like specifically the way I have accidentally ended up portraying that as, is I'm seeking wisdom from older characters. I play characters who are looking for mentors, I'm playing characters who are looking for guidance, lore, dad. just... A dad. <laughs> yeah, it's Kyle was my it. dad once, sort of, and he taught me how to be a detective. Why is that just who you are? Um, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I'm, I'm looking for characters who are going to give me their wisdom. I play very, specifically I'm playing a very reckless little teenager right now, who is kind of dying because of my actions, but you know, that's just what happens when lore happens. Um, so... I wisdom is definitely the stat that I suffer with the most. I would say more than any other one thing that a person could put their finger on in a role playing game, low wisdom propels the story forward. Oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. For sure. Stumbling into things. Yeah. Amazing. All the like, mm. you... roll me a spot check. Roll me a perception check. Like <clears throat> the things the GM does to get you to notice things or to like start an encounter, <clears throat> all launched from making or failing that. Perception roll, which is linked to wisdom, yeah, or the or the recklessness, or the not thinking your actions through, mm-hmm. not being self aware of what your what consequences are going to come down the line. That's every game. Yeah, like the famous instance when uh, Mary knocks down the set of armor in like uh, Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. He's like, "Fool of a took," and then all the goblins and everybody start getting pissed. Um, they can I get that as a ringtone or a oh. text tone? Mm-hmm. Fool of a took. Uh, it's free, guys. Go ahead. Um, but that where he just knocks it over because he doesn't notice it's behind him, and he's like, "So oh. there was a moment in my second game I've ever played in where we had a player who found a rusty knife and." He just picked it up and kept asking, hey, is there anything special about this knife? And he kept rolling and he's like, nope, there's nothing special about this knife, says Kenny the GM, who is about to ruin my life for the next year. Um, is that because you started dating? Or- no. Oh! I, no. Kyle, let's go. <laughs> so, because this person keeps asking about this rusty knife, it's like, alright, so, uh, yeah, there's a spirit trapped in the knife. And then the spirit proceeds to start saying ominous things specifically geared towards my character. Uh, we end up taking it to a cult <laughs> called the Cult of the Rusty Knife, <laughs> where anything about that could have like signaled that maybe this was a bad idea. But that character and his friends who went with them to initially get there were not very wise, I should say. <laughs> and I suffered for it. It was a demon in there specifically meant to kill me. And mm. I have to proceed with that, though. It was one of the cases of DM where um, I had no plans for this because I was like, whatever. And after they asked me three sessions, three sessions straight, what's in there? I'm like, fine, it's a demon. Like, what do you want from me? <laughs> Is this <laughs> what you want? You're like, yeah. And people. they said, yes. I'm like, cool. And then I made it. I just built it from there. We took the spirit, put it into a skull, took the skull to a cult of the rusty knife, which revived the demon, which then tormented my character for the next 20 years of her life. So... Here's the uh, Lewis from character. here's the conflict here though that I see is that all of these decisions, bad or not, are fun. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Like that demon <clears throat> knife, uh, you know, <laughs> you with the idol, Nina. Like all of those things are maybe not the wisest choice, but they're fun. It gives the GM something to respond to. The players get in a little bit of trouble. Now, don't do it all the time. Sure, that, and then it gets a little old. But like, 
But my point being, like, really... <laughs> outside of a, like, number crunchy, as we've been calling it, like, you know, straightforward campaign where you're, like, you got your pull out and you're, like, tapping bricks to see if there's a trap there. <laughs> you know, like, grab by a tap and pull. You're just like, um, all right, and I have three spell slots left today. George, uh, how many how many cleric spells do you have left, George? Uh, we're looking at a solid 15 cleric spells. Oh here. my gosh, that's <laughs> yes. all right. No wonder we almost died in the last battle. You're not casted, George. <laughs> George, you're supposed to use the spells. George. Oh. <laughs> um, but anyway, like, you know, playing a, in, as we've described it, high wisdom character could maybe be anti-fun in that you're the type of... No, everyone, we're not going to touch the idol. We're going to, like, have the cleric go over, perform the spell of purification. Um, I have this bag, this, this target bag. I'm putting it... George, I'm putting the skull in the target bag. Are you seeing this, George? Are you seeing this, George? No. Did you cast clarification? Are we going to go back to target? Do we have a receipt? <laughs> I have the receipt in my back pocket, too. We're taking the skull back. <laughs> I'll be like, down for store credit. That's fine. Target's got a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, I love Target. Uh, <laughs> but, like, you know what it's I mean? It's there's is the, um This is the question, then. Is it removing some fun being a high wisdom character because you're the person always being like, nope, we got to do it this way. Like, we got to play everything super safe. I'm very... I am reflecting my entunement with the world. I have something to add. There are ways to ha- play fun, high wisdom characters in the sense of playing people who are responsible to a T, but like Captain Holt from Brooklyn Nine Nine. Oh he's a gosh. high wisdom character, <laughs> yes. and he's fucking great. Um, hard to agree. Hard to agree. Yeah, but like you know what I mean. Yes. I just, how do I describe that? Tag team. Okay, so he is responsible, understands the rules and the procedures that go along with the job that he does, but he is also willing to improvise and get away from his mold when he can read a situation correctly. He also has a corgi named Chatter. He does. So what you're saying is... They need to use their wisdom to assess the situation. Or someone that's responsible for the party and, like, lets things happen, but knows that they can help get them out of the situation. Yeah, usually a high So basically, Sir Ritter. Sir Sir Ritter. (laughs) Like, at at any point, Raumir's just like, I'm gonna hop (laughs) this swamp. I'm gonna hop into the swamp. And Sir Ritter's just like, alright, be careful. And just, that's it. That's the conversation. If you can't be good, you better be careful. Katrina constantly. But I I, I think actually Sir Ritter is like, uh, Clayton's character in our our current Mm -hmm. um, RPG is like the epitome of a, uh, you, it is high, you're you're a high wisdom, right? Pretty high wisdom. Yeah. Like a, like a fun high wisdom character. (laughs) Like a bit like the, the, like Kyle said, like the tiefling twins are not high wisdom at all. And Sir Ritter's still over here, like, he's, he's got he's got his armor, and he's got his flying lizard, and he's just like, oh, all right, let's go, let's do it, I love this idea, let's let's make sure we don't die. Kids don't get hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think one of the, um, maybe the, the, the sliding scale for wisdom characters could be how much you externally communicate that wisdom. Um, if you're, uh, high wisdom and you're always communicating that wisdom, then you could be a mentor type, or you could be a fucking annoying ass know-it-all who never lets anybody have any fun, fucking straight edge kid at a party. Uh, <laughs> and not there's nothing wrong being straight edge, but a straight edge person who's constantly being like, "Do you really need that second beer? I saw you finish that first one in this last hour pretty quickly." And I shotgun it. Um, How's it going, dudes? <laughs> but if you have a high wisdom character who doesn't really say much, then they could be the kind of person who is like very tactical, maybe like yeah. always in their head looking at the situation and like analyzing, but more. Or perhaps they could be a very like kind of selfish character who who lets people get into trouble, or, you know, I struggle with wisdom, but this has actually kind of helped me formulate what wisdom is a little more. Yeah, like, the way I always saw classic wisdom, again, going back to source material with Tolkien, like, um, Aragorn, he was the one that everybody goes to to say, like, hey, you're the ranger, like, you've seen this before, right? He's like, oh, yeah, this is how we navigate through here, this is what you should use, use your cloaks now. No, that would be uh, when he was referred to as Strider. Strider, (laughs) yeah, I was gonna say, so that's what I'm saying, like, that's the mentor, usually high wisdom translates to a mentor-ish character, or you're right, like, if you're looking to not be that person who's literally, like, grandfather in the party through here, it's gonna be someone who, if they come to you to ask a question, they're gonna trust you to have that, like, almost font of knowledge where you're like, hey, you're used to the Feywild, like, what have you seen here before? And then you're like, okay, here's some things about the Feywild, like, careful, don't touch that, she's touching the tree. <laughs> and someone's yeah. like, whoops, and then the plot happens. I was actually thinking, like, there's, like, there's, the, in, in my mind, there's, there's two 
like types of wisdom characters, and there's one that's like the strict high school principal, and then the, there's the other one that's just like the, the cool college age older brother. Oh, you're right, yeah, <laughs> like, absolutely right. One of my favorite wise tropes is the incredibly vague older figure who knows so much, but you haven't proven that you are worthy of knowing the straight answer yet until you do X, Y, or Z. Like, the character who's just like, oh, yes, I know what's going on, says a vague hint, lets you go off in the woods to try to figure it out. Should I they know this? the whole time what's going on. They know exactly <laughs> what the quest. plot is. They know exactly what magical sword you need to go find. But they're not going to tell that to you. Don't touch that. They're not going it's to my lunch. give you the answer <laughs> because they've had to learn it themselves. So now you have to learn. But they're going to help yeah. you just enough. Just enough to get you on your way. Take take your Pokemon, go out into the woods, go beat up those birds. Like, Professor Oak, he knows something. <laughs> He's just trying to bang your mom. No. No. You, you saw the way those pixels looked at your mom. <laughs> I don't think they've ever talked in the game. Blend. But yeah, like, that was one of my favorite ones. It's just the wise old figure who just begs at you constantly. Yeah. It's just fun for me. I love those characters. Especially when they're very loony. It's terrible when they're like, hey, uh, Mr. Looney character, oh. should I touch this tree? And they go, and you're like, 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 like Boomy from, from yeah, Boomy. Um, Avatar's Last Airbender. I've been sitting here, like, racking my brain. I was like, what is that character called? Are there ways to play low wisdom characters without being the naive person or the kind of, like, foolhardy, like, rushes in, touches everything person? Like, yeah. are there any other... Archetypes for a little wisdom. I don't know how to do it. Yeah, right, you make an argument for um. You're right. Foolhardy bravery. Like you'd be much braver than others, but to a fault. Where you're like, I'm going to charge this door, and like, well, we know there's a trap. Like if I set it off, it doesn't set for you guys. So like, I'm making a sacrifice because I'm the one willing to do it. So I think, but you're right. It's kind of. I think overwhelming confidence could be a low yeah. wisdom character. So it's less foolhardiness of just like, well, I want to touch everything as much as it is just like, even if I touch this and something happens, like, I got it. Um, it's fine. Right. I think the the part right. of uh, Clara's character that that you mentioned of like looking for wisdom and looking for a mentor would be an interesting way to play. Like I know that character is also very like foolhardy and whatnot. Oh, yeah, but, she is reckless. But like like the the concept of a low wisdom character that's just really really looking for a mentor. Would the be... apprentice. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. The apprentice. That's a, that's a good that's it's a good way to phrase like, it. Younger oh, characters. The Nicolas Cage your... film. The Magician's <laughs> Apprentice. Yeah. Younger, that's it, yeah. Kid. But if you're like a, a teenager, or younger character, it's usually you play a less wise person. Like you have more to learn about the world. So. Well, there's only one left. So everyone, mm -hmm. let's just let Haley talk for 15 minutes about charisma. <laughs> All right, yeah, hey, um, you guys want to hit, like, steak and shake or something? Oh, right. oh, well, Haley, you have fun here. P I please turn this. the mic off when you're ready. Right. Well, not here you go, session. Session. Here, <laughs> good, good session today. Wait, so uh, Kyle, the last one's swim check, right? Swim. Wait, swim. Wait, swimming with skill. Intelligence, <laughs> <cost>, agility, <laughs> wisdom, uh, swim. Swim check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, everyone, we're talking about... Charisma. Charisma! A demeanor. We, we call it demeanor in this household. Uh, the you one mean? true and only stat you need. Let's be The barbarian cool. disagrees. Charisma is my dumb stat, if you can't freaking tell by now. It's my favorite stat. I love it because I feel like it's super flexible with what you can do with it. Um, I've never played a character... Only once in a one shot have I played a character with low charisma, but if I'm playing, you were campaign... forced. You were forced to not play that character because we wrote characters for each other. I'm not talking that were about purposefully... that. Purposefully, oh, then then you've done it twice. Apparently, I've done it twice. Yeah, I played a Nosferatu in a vampire one shot who uh, thought she was an ace detective, but she's just ugly. <laughs> More like an ace defective. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Kyle, you're back. You're back on Kyle. <laughs> Oh my god, you're in your place. Can I get the, the, the definition of charisma real oh, quick? Because yeah. I feel like it's going to be a Gucci one. <laughs> this is actually the longest one. Hell yeah, it is. Charisma measures your ability to interact effectively with others. It includes such <laughs> factors as confidence and eloquence. And it can represent a charming and commanding personality. Um, something Apocalyptia adds to demeanor slash charisma that I really like is um, it also reflects your... Um, emotional and just the, the the resilience of your personality. A lot of people in Apocalyptia are tempted to have a demeanor of one, the lowest it can be, and give all these other combat stats, just the, the starring role in the show. But that character, for one thing, is going to have a lot less luck to pull themselves out of situations. 
but they're also going to be very fragile when things don't go their way. Uh, Psyche to, is based on demeanor, correct? Mm-hmm. To kind of go back to wisdom and D and D, that wisdom is more the purview of that in D and D. That's like whenever, um, like in Call of Cthulhu, um, your your wisdom determines how much psychic trauma you can take before your character goes insane. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I think, your will. Yeah, I think my favorite thing, just real quick riffing on the um, Apocalyptia thing, and my favorite thing about demeanor in Apocalyptia is that it also extends to animals. Mm-hmm. Like that's where animal handling is is under. Um, mm. Like I don't know what that would be in in in, in D D. It's a skill called animal handling, and it is based on charisma. Is it? Oh, okay, cool. I didn't I didn't know that about D D. I think that's really interesting. I kind of thought that was an apocalyptic thing, but I'm <laughs> I have no idea how to play RPGs. <laughs> low in low wisdom. <laughs> yeah, one of those the I'm for the first time ever really like I played a lot of sor- a sorcerer that failed before, but sorcerers in D and D are charisma based to do spells. And um, I'm playing a very, like, 18 charisma, like, very sure. high right now. And, um, I didn't know that sorcerers were charisma. Uh, God, I have yes, no idea about d d <laughs> But I'm not a charismatic guy. But I'm actually playing just this goofy guy who's good at talking to people because people naturally like him because he's, like, he's very unwise. Oh, he's wait, just, you mean just... You. You. You cracked through the shell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I, similar to me, but he has a funny accent. He's a little hot, but actually does me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. So imagine me in D&D. He's only a little hot. <laughs> He's only, yeah, but um, no, but I'm playing a halfway with very high charisma, but not playing him to be like this soothsayer who everyone loves speaking to, rolling charisma to convince people to do things for me. He's, again, he's more actually like a loner who just walks around. His charisma I've translated to is an incredibly adept ability to be a sorcerer, and he's like, again, he can talk to people well, but I ne- never rolled once to be like, I roll my charisma to convince something, because that's not who he is. Yeah, sorcerers are masters of their own personality and exactly, will, yeah. and that's what allows them to cast spells, yeah. not years of study and training. Yeah, and he's, the way I have his charisma is kind of like what you were saying, more of a, his mental a force. Is, <laughs> he has his connection with his, like, he's centered within himself and knows who he is perfectly, and that's why I've extrapolated <laughs> that he has almost like a self-awareness, and that's why he can cast these spells so well, and that's how I play that 18 not that he can just make people do things for him or get through situations by talking because that has never once worked for him. In fact, most situations go wrong for him because he talks. Haley, I want to go back to you saying that you think charisma is the most flexible stat. What do you mean by that? Because I can always get what I want. Um, but you, charisma could always be I could flatter someone, I could intimidate someone, I could lie to someone. There are so many different ways to get what you want. And, um, that's, and also... I, I don't play too much D&D. I play a lot of um, World of Darkness. <clears throat> and my character who did, she was like maxed out. By the end of the campaign when we finished playing these characters, I had five in every single social stat. And in your disciplines, your max is five. For mine, I had seven. And all of my attack rolls I used charisma for. Why? Um, How? I was what? a daughter of <laughs> Cacophony. And my powers were I could sing and make people believe. Oh, in their you were uh, you were okay. I guess I was, I was for some reason thinking like hunter yeah. Or I something. used performance huh. to attack, and um, I love it. I can do something that's pretty and fun and performance, but I can also make your brain bleed from screaming. It's my favorite thing. Uh, I I just really like it. I like feeling like a boss ass bitch in control of myself. It's my own little fantasy. So Plus what do you also, do when you don't have anybody else around? In, in like, real life? Charisma requires other living entities of intelligence around you to command and do things. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what, what I'm what, saying. What if you're in, like, a, a, a dangan or you're facing a dragon? A dragon? I'm going to seduce the dragon. No. You know who I am. Dragon don't want to fuck no human. Well, you... Excuse me. All if a dragon wants a donkey... <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. I, always, is that... I figured that was a human wanting to fuck a dragon, not the other way around, but it doesn't really oh, matter. We, we like consent in this universe. I'm, I am a very social creature in real life, and I always play characters that are because, for me, the fun comes from interacting with people. <clears throat> Why would I want to play someone who sucks at interacting with people Then I'll never be encouraged to but do the thing? My point is that what do you do when your high charisma characters uh, go into a a dangan, a dungeon, if you will, <laughs> and and you and goddamn and, rumpus, and, 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 and you're not <laughs> there, there, there's no one else around. Uh, do, does that come as a weakness to that type of character? How do you get around it? How does your high charisma character deal with that? See, my my answer would be I wouldn't go in there, or I would have convinced other people to come with me. Uh, so I know that's not what you're looking for. So I guess it could be seen 
as a weakness, but if I was given that challenge, I would find some fucking way to use my charisma. Like, and no, I would that, do that's it. That's not the well, answer. Uh, no, that is the answer. The, you're, you're, the walls are hey, made of cold stone, and the doors are made I of cold steel. I seduce the stones. Okay. <laughs> okay. I right. think. I, I, Anybody else would like to try to answer this question for me? Yes. Um, I yell, "Barbarian, use your strength!" <laughs> and the barbarian breaks the door down, and then I thank him. Well, if you're a bard. I guess. Well, the whole have, point... Or a sorcerer, you could just melt the walls. You but have, again, like, that's... buffing skills that rely, at least statistically, on the charisma modifier. But don't you remember you're all alone in this dungeon, according to KP? Yes, I'm, I didn't and... say that. You might be with PCs, but your charisma's not going to convince a PC but, to do something. Yeah, but oh. that's the Depends thing, on like, the DM. Like... Fair enough. We did Sorry, just do an episode I, on that. I misunderstood the question. My, yeah. uh, either way, that there aren't people around that you can manipulate. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? You can still at, use at the, at the your charisma to buff your stats. Like, even for, like, let's say I wasn't doing Annalise, who's super manipulative and wants to convince other people. Like, Abena, I use most of my stats to buff people in battle. I had my little flute that I would play, and it would give people stats for initiative. You know, I could still use my charisma to do helpful things like that in combat. And that's one thing I really like that you touched on, KP, because it is true. This is the stat that, unless you're, again, playing one of my favorite classes, Sorcerers, this relies on other living things. And that's why I love Sorcerers, because it's a way of weaponizing charisma. And that's why, in that case, like, let's say you are the charismatic Sorcerer, you just teleport out and you're good. Mm-hmm. Okay, you bar- don't need other people. Bards also don't true. super rely on other people for a lot of their spells. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, those two classes are, like, a really good example of yeah. how you don't need to be... I mean, usually bards are stereotypically, like, all, oh, I'm a bard. But you can play a bard <laughs> who's more reclusive, but has high charisma, like I'm doing with my... Um, Sorcerer, because that's just their their stat to do all their stuff. Um, so I've away. played a bard, and I've only played a very few select uh, charisma characters. I can only think about two off the top of my head. Um, I've made characters who are just attractive and would have charisma, but like that was not their focus. Um, this one, specifically a bard, was actually based off a player self-campaign. And uh, I was a musician, um, as I brought my clarinet with me into the world. Oh my um, god. Yeah, so I had a clarinet. My bard I'm... right now has a clarinet. <laughs> Excellent. So <laughs> I had spells that would allow me to scare other human beings and humanoids. I had perform, so I would go out and make money for the party. Um, and all of my spells relied on my charisma skill, um, which was decently high. I don't remember exactly what it was, um, but it was decently high. So the party relied on me to convince people to, like, keep them decently able in combat. I don't know if I had any healing, but I definitely had some buff spells. So I'd go around just, like, every turn, I would just buff, 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 until I ran as puzzle slots, because I didn't know how to play D&D. So, um, like, I, I don't oftentimes play a charisma character to manipulate, I guess. I prefer the buff route and, like, the help route with charisma and, like... Like, speaking for people who don't have the skill to speak. Yeah. Like, I like to, um... Representing the unrepresented. Yeah. I have a character right now in a Star Wars game that we're playing that is charismatic um, on her own and also when she rolls. Usually the rolls are a little bit more to convince very, very stubborn people. But she is the face of the party. She is the captain. She is the one that people talk to. And I just convinced a very stubborn NPC to join our party without having to roll. And I felt really accomplished Mm -hmm. with that because I just had a very good argument. She was a charismatic person and just fit the scenario. So I prefer personally to have, like, more of a helpful role and less of a... I'm going to make you do exactly what I want role. I rely on, like, other powers for that kind of thing. And I think that's one of the truly beautiful things about a high charisma character, because we talked about things out of our comfort zone. For the most part, in new D&D groups, it's speaking with the party and giving somebody that chance to, like, hey, we're going to make you the like voice of the party. This is your chance to really not only come out as a friend, but to come out as just being a better speaker, because D&D really can't help with that. So it's cool to give people that voice they may not have otherwise. Like, honestly, that character I just mentioned, um, her name's Kelpie. I personally have felt more confident as myself being her. Like, I'll walk around the house and just be like, yeah, pretty great. Um, <laughs> just because of her whole personality of, yes, I am deadly, I'm attractive, and I'm in control of the situation. She has given me almost like an inner peace to myself. And I, like, I've, I've noticed I've been more kind to myself. I've been more complimentary to myself just because I have to get into her mentality um, and I've never had that with another character before, like, having that, like, directly positive impact on my mood. 
Why do you think a lot of systems, like, so you mentioned the cacophony vampires, right? Mm -hmm. And sorcerers we're all familiar with. Charisma as a damage stat, as a spell casting, as a, as a font of magic, um, that's curious to me. <laughs> where, where does that come from? It's, well, the the origin of charisma is that it is, is a God-given gift to <clears throat> lead and influence people. That is, <laughs> oh, that is the original <laughs> definition of charisma. Really? That's weird. Did not know that. said it best earlier, that it's the power from within which sorcerers have. They don't have to learn it and like use this arcane magic they draw from another plane. It's just their own font, which, you're right, it's like God-given, not divine. Yeah, that, that, that's like that's my favorite thing about the description of bards in uh, 5e. It's like their magic comes from themselves and they like pick apart the strings that hold the planet, like, like they'll hold the universe together and stuff like that. Like, I forget how it's specifically described. It's really cool. I think but, about... it, yeah, no, yeah. like, it, it seems like a really, like, in, intrinsic, like, God-given gift, interestingly enough. Well, that's what makes Mage in New World of Darkness interesting, is because, sure, you're, like, manipulating, like, the power in the world and stuff, kind of like the Bard and, and such, but everyone always thinks Mages are cheating, because they're, like, you know, playing outside the rules, and, like, they don't follow the same, like, conventions that, like, a Vampire or, you know, a uh, Promethean would, and, like, they, like, Sin Eaters really hate him, because, like, <laughs> Sin Eaters have this, like, you know connection with death and all they get all their powers from like the nether world or the twilight realm or whatever it's called fucking i don't know um but the mages are over there just the like the dark basement the dark they all the powers <laughs> from the dark basement you know. um but then the mages are over there just like i'm gonna pop a yui on this motorcycle and go through this dimensional portal to the moon <laughs> fuck you and everyone's yeah. just like bye <laughs> have fun uh and but that's like in my mind incredible like even though charisma in World of Darkness works differently from, you know, D D. And you're not really using those to cast spells, maybe some spells, but it's still just like that does that to me from our preconception of charisma is a charisma based magic. You know, because like it's not really coming from God, it's coming from like I think it's like fucking Atlantean shit <laughs> or something. Um and you're all over there just like, Woo! Go to the moon and they're like, What are you gonna do up there? How are you gonna breathe? And they're just like, I don't need oxygen. You look at the rule book and they're like, They're right, they don't need oxygen. <laughs> Fuck. Um, ten out of ten. World of Darkness is my absolute all time favorite gaming god fuck words. I really like World Darkness, but period. We're system. You <laughs> system. Are we're the system. You system somehow. Uh, because it lets you do so much with charisma. Like, I was in a LARP, and it, the stat is in the game, but the you're way you use it in LARPing. a LARP, fuck you. Uh, you can literally use your charisma game? as a defense mechanism. Not a defense mechanism. You can use your charisma to, as almost like a dexterity stealth. Like, if someone's trying to attack me, I'd be like, nope, I have two dots in presence. You can't hit me. I'm too cute. You feel bad. What? Yeah, it's an actual That's thing. That's so dumb. It's an actual that thing, and I use it all the ever. time. Is it, is it too cute to get hit? Hulu, I, th I mean, that's the Nina Richter story. I'm really, like, <laughs> come on. I think your whole life, people have just been allowing you to do whatever you want with your charisma stat. And that's why you only play charisma characters, because everyone's just like, yeah, yeah. Charisma means you got high HP, high attack, high stealth, <laughs> high um, uh, dexterity, um, and not to mention you can manipulate, intimidate, and basically do anything you want. So I think I think there might be a problem here. Uh, saying my real life charisma is too high for you? No, I'm saying that you need to, like, maybe break outside the box and play some different types I've of characters. I've been trying! Also, I only, I'm only drawing attention to the fact that in this LARP thing, yeah, um, you're like, LARP. I have two dots of presence, which means you cannot punch me. You think I'm cute. That's so, that's, that's so okay. subjective. To be real, to be real, that's not the actual definition. The definition of it is, is um, you can, I'm going to pull it, pull it up because it's in the mind's eye theater, two dots of presence. Oh, and, and it's the symbol of this where it's like, you can't hit me. I... Defense. Nice, nice defense. showing a hand sig signal on a podcast. I love all these visual <laughs> gags. Oh, okay. Um, while Haley's looking for that, I've only ever played a high charisma character one time, and he was an absolute nightmare. <laughs> Who was he? In a good way. It's, I've talked about before, it's that character I stepped outside the box with, uh, Clara. You ran that game. You know very well who I'm talking about. Shale? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, just, uh, didn't let anyone else talk. Uh, was very, like mean to people that wasn't his friends. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if I really have a grounding for how to play a high charisma character. Yeah, I like breaking the mold. That's why I set my new character. I didn't like playing him as, like, the face of the party. 
So I thought it was just fun to be like, I did all the talking, and I was like, that's what a charisma character does. And other people are like, let me talk. And I'm like, no. Impossible. I'm talking now. (laughs) I am the captain. You have been stopped. I have a question. Mm -hmm. How does one play a low charisma character and not get, like, steamrolled by high charisma characters? Good question. That's a lot of the social contract for one thing. Sure. Well, right. A lot right. of my uh, kit players, I always say, like, hey, um, when it comes to... It's the way they usually do it, how I've seen in my 3-5 games. Everyone, it depends what your expertise is. Like, let's say, um, because I'll give you bonuses, like, if they're talking the arcane school, we had a warlock, and, like, you probably have more clout here versus other people. But if it's a critical role, like a villain or something they need to succeed, they say, okay, we know you were the best talker. We're going to use you for the role. So they use the highest person for the role, but the person that was right for the context otherwise. And that was just because they had a fair open group. And that was awesome. But for a group, let's say if you're new, like let's say with war gamers, you came in there. I guess you'd have to try to establish oh, that. Rest in so peace, you can't war go gamers. In there anymore. That's, <laughs> yeah, I just, I'm saying like if you're the new group of people, you don't know it is much harder because they're like, oh, I have the highest stat. I like Shale. I, I, I'm talking now. <laughs> I'm sorry, you cannot talk. <laughs> yeah, your question gets kind of. About... <laughs> wow, in action. Your question kind of gets at the core concept of what charisma is because. Charisma is your force of personality, mm-hmm. and if you don't have force of personality, people are just going to walk over you or impose their will on you, or you're just going to be this meek character who doesn't really say anything mm-hmm. because they don't. They're just the shy per. They're just the shy wallflower sitting back and just waiting for everybody else to do their thing, so that like on their turn on initiative they get to act. But as far as like communicating. They usually don't. I I think my question that that makes sense, but I, th- I, I like, do you have to play a timid and meek, low charisma character, or can you just play like a like s- socially clueless character? That yeah. Um, the t- out of the one of the two low char- charisma characters I played, uh, my Nosferatu thought she was the fucking shit. Just because you're low in stats does not mean you're personal assessment has to reflect that low number. To me, one of the most stereotypical example of a very low charisma is like what everybody imagines a barbarian to be. Uncouth, doing social faux pas left and right because they just don't know what the right, what the Mm -hmm. situational quote, right thing to do in that situation is. I think to act, you need to use actions, not words, if you're a low charisma character. If, If you, the player, want to do something and you know your character wouldn't be like, hang on one moment, everyone, please. Let me pitch to you this idea I've just birthed from my, my brain. Um, you would just do the thing. Yeah. And and now, mind you, there's a social contract in, mm-hmm. in your group. You have to be like, hey, DM, um, I, I walk up to the guard at the gate, and I get him in a fucking full Nelson right now. And and the DM has to say, okay, you know, give me a roll. Like, do that. And the rest of the party can bitch and moan all they want. But you're doing that, even yeah. if it was, you know, not a wise thing to do, or not a you know, sort of <laughs> yeah, thing yeah, to yeah, do. They're still jackknifing the guard. Yeah. He's going <laughs> down. <laughs> so that's happening one way or another. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you're right, though, because one thing that's interesting about Charisma, too, is that does not inherently make you the most intelligent person, either. So this Charisma person could have all the confidence in the world, go up to a guard they've never met from the city. Let's say, the, and I did this before in a game, I, I was a, um, a healer and had very a pretty good Charisma, and I forgot my own hometown that you can't use magic, because I just hadn't been there in a while, and my that he didn't tell me is the real Fuck. So I immediately went and cast a spell while a wise character would be like, I read the sign. You can't cast spells. And I'm like, what? And I'm casting a spell in front of the guard. I can't like, read. Look at this fire. Here. Yeah. That's the thing, though. They can go in there and make this faux pas and say, like, hey, you never say this word to this person or they'll go insane. They say, like, you know, the knights who say me say me to this person. They start going crazy. And the, wi- the wisdom character is like, let me talk. You're going to ruin everything charisma characters. So that's what you have to realize that doesn't inherently mean you have in every situation you're the end all be all. My, I think, first ever game, I had a player who sort of unintentionally presented a low charisma character in that they really wanted to buy, like, a potion or something. But I was new to the game, so I didn't really know, like, where the... Like, it, was a, it wasn't, like, a standard potion. It was, like, a uh, poison or something. And I was like, I don't know where you would buy that. Um, and then, jokingly, someone was just like, well, maybe the black market. And I was like, yeah, that could be. Uh, maybe <laughs> Excuse black market. me, where is the black market? Literally, this, this player <laughs> walked so up to a guard and was just like, okay, fine, where is the black market? And the guard was just like, "What? what? Come with me. <laughs> yeah, like, like, are, like so, I, it's in the prison. Have you, Hello. Have, you been, have you been drinking too much? Like, are you okay?" Um, and the player got more and more flustered because then all of a sudden they realized, and this is why I think it was like a, a good example of a low charisma encounter because the player then was just like, "Shit, 
I said something I shouldn't have. They didn't react well. Got more and more flustered uh, <laughs> and, like, wasn't sure what to say. And then eventually just starts to run away from the guard. And by this point, the guard isn't even wanting to arrest her. That's a he's, little specific. He's, she, he's more specific. just like, is this person okay? Like, what's... Ma'am, come back! And, like, reaches out to grab her. And so without even thinking about it, the player just goes, yeah, I cast Tornado. <laughs> and, like, and then the party was running from guards. Well, excuse me, one person. The rest of the party never met them. Yeah. Uh, Haley, so. did you find your charisma shield? I did, I'm and curious. I actually would like to correct myself, because apparently we were not using it correctly in the LARP. Uh, it's actually awe, dot number one, in presence, and while it causes people to focus on you, uh, it specifically states that while it may cause people to trust you, it does not specifically say that they stop attacking you. Okay. So we were using it wrong, I guess. But uh, the way that it does present itself is that you can cause people to, like, Turn your attention and focus. You can be like, focus on me, listen to me talk while I get out of the room. So it stops people from, like, taking actions because they have to stop what they're doing to listen and or look at you. But that does not stop the intention of the combat. Does that make sense? I think a lot of charisma does base itself off the player because we have a friend who plays a lot of characters who like to be charismatic but in a way that is absolutely going to derail everything and anything possible. Uh, it somehow, through a series of events, they managed to cross-dress, convince a guard that they were not involved in the nonsense that they had created that got the rest of us in trouble, <clears throat> met a mummy, killed the mummy, stole a deed to the house, found a plot device, and then got back to us, all on nonsense charisma rolls. It's my Tuesday night. Though. Um, this is a real class in 3.5. They were a drug lord. They were drug lords. And that's a real class in 3.5. What? Yes. Yep, the uh, mainstays of that class. They are fist fighters, charismatic, and get money every turn from their enterprises. Yes. Or every, uh, like, session. Oh, it was part, the... it's part of, like, the I mean, sing... that's the dream, It no? is the dream. It's a really good class, and it's not homebrew. It's from, like, the, uh, what, Skullduggery, like, some... It's a very specific book, but... But the, the thing is, are... the things that this person said out loud would have never, ever convinced anybody in a real argument. No, I, I used the ever. numbers in the game. So, right, <laughs> crit. Yeah, let me like, in the vault. No, yeah. me I annoyed. implore you to reconsider. It's so annoying <laughs> because he rolls too. so, so well. well. But important note, fun fact for his character, I'll just throw this in. I was kind of proud of him for this. Um, he was like, I look, he's like, okay, if you want to imagine who I am, like, you've seen Scarface, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay, my name's going to be Dakota. Anthony Dakota. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so he's like literally just Tony Montana. Yeah, but, so, but like, if you are not a charismatic character, but you can deliver something, like, with your actual voice that sounds fine, sometimes you don't need to roll. But, like, in that instance, when they were making tiny whining noises and then rolling charisma and it worked, that would never work in a real person conversation. You'd never yeah. whined until you got what you wanted. Well, it's different when <laughs> he is wailing, just... You, you haven't met I'm gonna, I'm gonna need a vocal example. <laughs> <laughs> that's about... That's uh, so, oh, whoops, name dropped. Uh, yeah. But I was gonna say, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, oh, but, uh, like this character, I he's funny and he does end up always <clears throat> getting back to the plot. But the amount of nonsense that they just create from these nat twenties that are just given to him by the RNG gods are, is just unfair. To the next, almost a whole different podcast. I'd be interested in going in is the power of a nat twenty and how far you let your players go. Yeah. That is a very yeah. big, as a DM, I have struggled with that for years. Yeah. Good time. Well, it depends on the system. It does. In D and D, a nat twenty on a skill check is not a critical success. No, you're right. And that's what I'm saying. Three point five, I have much more leeway. Than other <laughs> yeah. But like, I'm currently playing a character in a game coming up who is charming in a very innocent kind of way because she just does not understand the ways of the world. She was raised in like a kind of separate little bubble of demigod kind of things. So in a the prelude to the game, we had like a little mini session to introduce our characters. I wandered upon the village, talked to some guard shield maidens. They looked at her and went, this is probably the least threatening thing we could ever encounter in our life because she just doesn't know what anything is. It's fine to let her inside the village. Uh, they let me into the village. I ended up making friends with nearly everybody just by being polite, kind, and, like, mm -hmm. talking to the chieftain. A little care bear. Yeah, and so, like, and then someone tried to swindle her out of a deal, and the chieftain looks around the corner and glares at them, and they're like, uh, we're changing our price. This is actually what it really is. And she's like, oh, wow, that's so much less than what you just said. That's wonderful. And, like, she just does not understand. 
but ends up making all these friends and great encounters happen, not by rolling charisma, but just being charismatic in person. Aww. So I'm not relying on the dice, so she is technically not a charismatic character, but just the way she delivers herself makes her a charismatic person. My goal here was to try and convince our listeners that you should not make charisma-based characters, because they can't do everything and anything. But they can! And apparently I'm fucking wrong. Well, no, I'm sorry. Kyle, before you join Kyle and Gygax. Stop making Christmas characters all the time. You <laughs> well, just go ahead and quit. I would say final thoughts <laughs> and charisma for me is, um, it's incredible for very specific. I'm, I'm a 3.5 guy. Like, that's where I really thrive. And I like the D&D definition of charisma. It has a specific use, like, every stat, but it is not the best. No stat is the best stat. No. So it, it's very good for characters who are looking to, obviously, speak and convince with diplomacy checks, or if you're, again, a sorcerer, that's just how you blast people in the face. But it will not save you from everything. Her counter-argument, it will. Never stop believing in yourself. Reach for the stars. Always play charisma characters. The end. I just want to counter Kyle's real quick about <laughs> charisma. Like, like, gone. That's fine. Um, Banished him with my charisma. I, don't, I, I just don't get how you would try to convince somebody to not play a charisma-based character when the bards in 5e are stupid. Stupid, oh, ridiculous. And like, like, bard, in three five bards can do. They have sorcery and like, like um, wizard abilities. But you vicious crazy. mockery somebody until they die. You just make fun of them until they die. But even then, there's ways to shut down bards by just silencing or throwing a big enough hammer at them. Yeah, and, and that, you know what? You're you're actually you're very right. Yeah, so that's why you want to make a bard quiet. You can also use literal silence. They can't say. So. I, again, in this game, I have like Jordan's character, the Marquis, and and Sir Ritter always being like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on. Come here. I guess oh. it really is up to the GM to be able to balance it correctly, because we have a character in one of the games I'm in whose main stat is charisma, and she is able to build that into her kit, which makes her, like, in a way, like Haley mentioned with the, like, disarming thing where you can't get hit, mm-hmm. it does increase her ability to dodge based on just, like, what she's built into it. Like, it's called, like, don't hurt this pretty face. So she appears to be unassuming so that people do not want to engage her in combat until it's too late and she's in her face. Mm-hmm. But then our DM had made characters who are, in fact, immune to certain levels of persuasion just because of either military training, they have uh, certain kinds of brainwashing going on, or like they're just too high of level slash like boss level, so a charisma role is never going to work. So to balance out that, it really is up to the GM to control that kind of thing. And I will say, charisma's, like, not for everybody, because yeah, there's other fun things to play. He's gotta be, like, really to special to have a high charisma character and make it work. <laughs> <laughs> not everybody can be me! Uh, Jesus so I was trying! PM. I was trying to say that there's merit in playing other things, too. It's trying to... Uh, trying to make it work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these these, these, these other skills thoughts. also have merit. Haley, quote, Haley, Michelle Trachtenberg. <laughs> uh, they're passable. I hate charisma characters. K- KD. <laughs> I really like playing charisma characters. I play oh, them you? a lot. You all fucking yeah. know that. <laughs> oh, it's fun. It's like you really like the charming pilot. I also hate playing wisdom characters, int characters, dex characters, con characters, How do you like the and strength characters. <laughs> you you like got playing? to the root of why you're you leaving know, the podcast. I, everyone, I'd like to leave you all with that question. Kenneth, can you say it one more time for the microphone? Kyle, do you, do you even like tabletop games? Have a good night, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, McLean, what do do you think about charisma overall? Like everything else, it has its place. Um, I, well, this is probably leading into a topic that could be just a greater episode topic, but like there is, there's definitely a line where more than any other stat versus a real player's ability, there is a, there can be a lot of bleed through. As, like the example of a very charismatic player being able to convince the game master to allow something without making a charisma check. It's a deft hand in order to uh, make sure that it all goes off well. So are we ready to move on to uh, talk about geek things? Yes, I have so many things. Uh, I'll start off. I've, I'm just going to go over a couple of them. Um, the first one is on Spotify. I have discovered an artist called Ambient Realms. And this is going to be the soundtrack for your game. Just search for Ambient Realms, and you can find music for pretty much any type of game you want to play. That's cool. I can't Um, wait to listen to that as I write my thesis this year. (laughs) 
Um, my other thing is a documentary that is on Netflix called The Devil We Know. It's about a um, situation that is going, or well, yeah, it's going on not too far from here in Parkersburg, West Virginia. It's only about 40 miles from where we are, where we currently are. Um, it's about Teflon and the chemicals that are used to make Teflon um, getting into people's bodies and the effects that it has and the fact that there was a class action lawsuit in the early 2000s, which I was a student at OU when that was going on and it was in all the papers. And um, it's tracks it's uh, it tracks from about 2000 up until um, the film was made, which was in 2018. Um, kind of the course of it and where we currently are. And there can be a sequel to this documentary because it's mm-hmm. still an ongoing thing. Wow. That's really interesting. I'd love to watch it. A friend of ours was actually, uh, their family was part of that class action lawsuit. So mm-hmm. we know um, a, a bit of that about that one. So mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know a person who's part of that as well. Yeah. Oh, uh, self-promotion time. Uh, tonight I uh, have a burlesque show that I'm a part of. Uh, we are the Goddess Collective. We're local here in Athens, and we are already starting to book our May the 4th show, which is Star Wars, Star Trek. I'm doing a Scooby-Doo number. I'm doing comic numbers. Uh, just a bunch of nerdy gals getting together to take our clothes off for money. You should come see it May the 4th. Also, much sooner, I will be hosting a Rathacon event at the Union on it's not January. Crap. February 22nd. I believe doors open at 8. Uh, we got a bunch of different bands playing. Uh, I'll be dressed up. You should come say hi. Uh, and then finally, I don't know if anyone wanted to talk about it, but uh, I'd like to have a moment of silence for our long lost friend, Oppie, the Mars Rover, who... Uh, no one calls it that. Fuck you. <laughs> uh, my dearest friend, Oppie. It's opportunity. You can mourn however you want. I like giving things cute nicknames. Um, the Opportunity I think NASA Rover. They, I was, I was actually going to call you about the NASA team <laughs> that runs the Mars Oppie. Rivers calls them Oppie. Oppie, um, their last words uh, were really beautiful. And then um, I was reading articles about it that they played the Opportunity Rover music while it shut down. And I've never cried over a robot before. Not even at the Iron Giant. This, this hurt. Uh, Kyle, do you uh, want to shed light on what Opportunity actually was? Uh, it was a pair of twin rovers. This was going to be my geek thing that we sent to Mars. Um, they have operated, uh, rather Opportunity, operated uh, for, was it 14 years? Yes, I think just the cusp of 15. Um, and uh, it was only supposed to last 90 days uh, mission time. Um, the twin rovers, um, Spirit was the other one. They were pretty instrumental in, uh, proving that Mars at one point in time, um, had, uh, surface water. Um, and, uh, it's, it's just a really incredible, um, like, like in my lifetime, I think it is the most incredible feat of human ingenuity, at least science related ingenuity. Um, the fact that this thing was operating through win- Martian winters and dust storms and through great adversity, um, and not to mention that at its maximum distance, it takes about 20 minutes for a signal to reach Mars. So um, it's uh, it's pretty wild that this thing um, kept going for 14 years, um, always sending back information, always doing science, uh, always proving that um, humans are meant to be more than just stuck on a planet that we are slowly killing. And we got something happy to talk about. Oh, this is happy. Sorry, yeah. that, that's me at my happiest. It's opportunity. <laughs> I would say uh, one of the cool things, definitely check it out. Um, there's a system I heard of years ago, and finally got a chance to dig into called Ruma. Um, it's one about. Um, it's it, it kind of takes place around um, Rome, so from the start to finish, but it's an alternate universe where uh, magic is there. So it's very imagine traditional myth like mythology fairy tales, all real, not like D and D wizard magic. Um, but it's supposed to be kind of like uh, based in faux history, so I'm kind of getting a group together to test that game out. Uh, kind of as a unique spin on all the stats we talked about today in a very cool way. Uh, they rename them, give them different meanings, kind of make it simpler. It's a, a game, imagine kind of like a Savage Worlds that's very easy to step into. Um, the static process only takes... only use a D6. Yeah, just a D6. Static takes no more than 10 minutes, even if you've never played tabletop before. They walk you through everything, and it's supposed to be, again, kind of a, a break into a system, so I'm going to see if this is an easy game I can do for one-shots going forward and just uh, entertain people. 
Sounds really fun. It's pretty cool. So Ruma, look it up. You can buy the PDF online. It's like six bucks or something. If you like robot fights, go watch Alita Battle Angel. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of fun with that. It was a fun movie. If you're looking for deep emotional investment, don't go there. But uh, the pacing's a little bit silly. But uh, if you want really fun fight scenes that involve cyborgs, definitely go watch that movie. I had a lot of fun with it. And also, I guess they're doing another X-Men movie. <laughs> uh, Dark Phoenix. And, uh... No, like, Dark Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I guess, uh... Oh my god, what's her name? Sansa. Yeah, Sansa. Yeah, her, yeah, she's playing Jean Grey, and she looks really pretty. Hmm. I don't know if it's in the canon universe or not. I it think looks it like is. it... I, I guess it might yeah. be. It's one of the most famous stories in X-Men. They've tried okay, cool it things film. I don't I mean, know about. X3 did the same thing, but it, they were building up to Dark Phoenix, and then, cool, we bombed. So we're actually getting the story this time. Boop, boop. Oh, everybody's looking at me, but I'm not a nerd. I don't have nerd things. All right, guys. Well, you say we stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice. Mm-hmm. See you, fuckers. Never. Bye. <laughs> Love you, guys. <laughs>